Hey, so before we start, I want to break character for a brief moment. I think this is important to say before I jump into anything. The Blackout Club is an okay game. My main issue with it is that it's built for a larger experience than the one it currently inhabits, but I'm about to beat it to death with a hammer regardless. However, I think there's a subset of people that will enjoy it way before the horrible pieces become fully noticed. My point being, talking about what makes it flawed might suck out what value there would be for the kind of people this game would speak to, and despite me not being very impressed with it, I can absolutely find myself rooting for the people who have poured their time, energy, and money into it. So if you have any interest in this game, and the money to burn, get it because I want to see more games like it, and for those into it, I think your first moments with it will be something special, and I don't want to take that away from you by explaining it. With that being said... The Blackout Club is the love child of Jordan Thomas, a level designer turned director who's a lot like Raiden from Metal Gear Solid. He had a big hand in a lot of really good games, but he just never made the full game, just the good bits of it. These meticulous little hands do great on small things, but the big things, that they're just big, okay? We can't all do big things. He's made levels like The Cradle and Thief and Fort Frolic and Bioshock, and then you find out when left to his own devices, he can make Bioshock 2 and, mmm, not terrible by any right, but Bioshock 2 is pretty lackluster when you compare it to a 1 in Infinite, so he's back to try again with the Blackout Club, and it's quite the elevator pitch. The thing I find hilarious about the story of the Blackout Club is that everyone's attempts to describe it on Twitter sound both wildly different while being exactly the same fucking thing. Stranger Things? Yeah, that's what the kids like these days, am I right? I'll try to describe it as a surreal horror story born out of the deepest wet dream of Joseph Fink with just a little little pinch of sweat from R.L. Stein. Well, that elevator pitch didn't work because the only person I could get to play this damn thing with was my little brother. Say hi, Mike. What's poppin'? It's a story that takes a lot of time to cover. Of course, I haven't exactly been using that time to pay off my loans or rebuild Notre Dame, so I might as well burn my son or an aid of explaining it. The Blackout Club is set in the small town of Hawkins, Red Acre, a nice little twilight zone where all the perfect little elements of a horror game come into one place. No cell service? Check. Everything created by one company that seems to control the town? Check. An overabundance of white people that seem more than happy to be father to a soul-crushing machine? You fucking bet! This is like that one Bloodborne boss except made of the corpses of other stories instead of human bodies or the Nintendo Switch if you want something more modern. You are a random, customizable teen that lives in this milquetoast suburban paradise where the only pieces of litter to be found are active flashbangs. I got him. I got him. Every night, you apparently wake up on the side of the road, covered in mud, with no memory of what you just did. So, you stay awake now and sneak off into town to find out what's going on. The problem is that every adult is still moving, sleepwalking through the night, looking for you. And from then on, it just gets deeper, and I kind of want to come back to those parts of it later on. Because how you actually learn the story of the Blackout Club is way more entertaining than the actual story of the Blackout Club. The game starts with a fairly effective prologue mission that just goes on a little bit too long, but yeah. You might have heard me going on about the town, because the town is pretty much the focal point for both game and story. I know I was making fun of it earlier, because it looks like it's covered in saran wrap, but I'm going to get a little more in-depth here. The map is somewhat randomized, and somewhat not. For one, this means that the town is a lot more like a normal town, and not a cobbled together set of assets mixed and matched by a computer instead of a person. And you can find bits of personality in every house you choose to look inside. And this does a really, really good job of creating this visage of a house that people actually live inside, and not just an obstacle course for you to jump through. It's not like Edith Finch levels of detail, but it's way better than the barren walls like you're in the fucking back rooms. The bad side about the map is that you can learn it, and well... Imagine I put a gun to your head and forced you to play Dishonored 2. Outside of being the best livestream ever filmed, I also only really wanted you to play the first mission. Again. And again. And again. After the fourth run, you know exactly where you're going, how to appropriately get through each building, where loot tends to be, and any exploits you need to do it faster. Red Acre is quite the large sprawling map, especially when you realize there's basically an entire second map underneath it. The maze is a more video gamey area. Fuck me, that's a way of describing it, genius. It's a video game. Of course, it's designed like a fucking video game. Alright, quit bitching. This area features more outlandish crap with surfaces that produce louder footprints and lighting tied to little mechanics in each room. It's also really fucking hard to get out of, and most of my failed missions ended up down here. Gameplay is on par what you'd expect from Jordan. It's a game with large areas that are highly dependent on interconnecting systems to create dynamic encounters. That's a pretentious way to say it's a stealth game. The primary enemies, sleepers, are blind, so they can only detect you by your footsteps. The other enemies get flushed in as time goes by, and there's actually quite a variety of enemies and obstacles. It really creates this awesome sense of creative flyby gameplay where you're constantly finding yourself in interesting situations and getting out of them in equally interesting ways. It's 
fun, really fun. Each scenario feels genuinely creepy, and there's a multitude of ways the situation can escalate to only make it more exciting. This is love without the lie. That was pretty depressing. Oh, jeez, these guys spread fast. Run. These Steven, guys spread fast. Go, go, go. Steven, 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 Steven. Oh, <laughs> Whew, close. Damn. Until you realize some of these aren't creative, they're just powerful. This is not a game that survives being learned. Once you find out that there is nothing to lose from opening all the windows and doors in a house, items only spawn inside closets and garages, you're invincible while sitting on a grappling hook, the shape can be bullied with flashbangs, every house has to have an open window for you to get through so you don't need to break the door down, and then you realize whatever was scaring you can be understood and beaten. And I know that comes off as uplifting, but this is a game that wants to be played long into the future. Leaderboard and offers of premium content lead me to believe this game wasn't meant to be disposed of by the end of the weekend. I was bored by level 6. 6! For those of you keeping score, that's about 3 to 4 hours of play. Yeah, 4. The experience drip is on fucking par with Chinese water torture. I'm sure the point was to try and keep me playing missions, but the drip was on the level of an old man's piss. At some point you needed to bust out the fucking scales and really think about that. It was like a chocolate cake, but each time you had to eat the fucking candles first. There's a variety of missions, but they have way too much overlap to keep you entertained on repeat playthroughs, so it becomes a lot of second verse same as the first. Most missions are just a variety of collect thing and place thing, and sometimes you just have to fucking wait because someone thought it was a good idea to not let the team place objects if one person grabbed all the items, so if you're playing with a random and they just have all the items, you might as well turn to your computer and type up a new paragraph on how fucking stupid this is. God damn it. <laughs> Every time you gain a level, the game's randomizer changes by adding bigger enemies and more traps. For example, the amount of sleepers slowly get reduced and the amount of lucids replacing them gets increased. Lucids are enemies that can see you and are generally way more aggressive than the sleepers. They also look like this. I kinda like their dialogue though, it gives off this neat little impression of some obnoxious guidance counselor. You also unlock the stalker at level 5, but he's a pretty complex deal so I'll come back to him later. Thank god that someone built this house on the edge of the fucking world. And finally, there's the shape. Someone present from the start, but his AI starts to take on more aggressive traits the longer you play. The shape is your main threat. He's an invisible and invincible being that stalks you after you've been caught too many times. The only way you can see him is by closing your eyes, some sort of dedicated lore button. Which is kind of scary the first time, but if I haven't repeated myself enough already in this video, nothing is scary five times. And if I'm being honest, the game might have survived as an indie story based adventure with some larger customization options, but it's very clear that wasn't what the devs had in mind. Not when I look at the progression system. The progression system is very, very bare bones. Your character can equip three things, hero items, major powers, and minor powers. Hero items and major powers are distinguishable by the fact that they are called something different, but I'll dive into both anyway. Hero items are items that can only be found in the train and usually serve a unique function. The taser tases, the grappling hook grapples, and then there's the crossbow that requires ammo so no one fucking uses it. Major powers can pretty much do the same thing, except they can be upgraded a little bit piece by piece. I used most of them with the exception of the takedown ability and they all felt pretty good. The prank call though can be a bit annoying. Personal yes. calls at work. Shame, Hello. Shame. Do you want to make more money? Of course you do. Discover the quick, easy ways to luck, fame. Just to offer do you, you. want to make more money? Of course you do. Dis Hello. Do you want to make more money? Hello. Do you want to make more money? Hello. Of course you want to make more money. The minor powers, though don't really do much. There's barely any and they're all variations of start the mission with this item, start the mission with this item, and this item. None of these change how you play and they're just kind of convenient. I don't play video games for comfort, okay? Why are you making this so fucking hard for me? This is a lot like when your local frozen yogurt place is going hashtag make it for Ben and sure Ben's a nice kid but you don't like ice cream and you don't want Ben to die but you know what it would be my fault if I passed up the frozen trash and you don't know that's not my fault you guys put Ben's hands in your life so you shitty ice cream. And yeah, I know the game's only 30 bucks, but as a foundation for something that is to be improved upon, this is a double tap right in the head. In-depth upgrades are one of the very few things that can keep players sticking around when the core gameplay loop lacks variation. Sustainability is the word of the day. You see, most of these complaints are, in a word, nitpicks. They're a bunch of little things that would be perfectly acceptable in most games because, well, they're built to handle little issues. But this game wants to be played for years to come, and that's not happening. Not unless some major content drops in very soon and it hits very, very hard. Like, this team, from what I can gather, has their roots in a hardcore story-based game, and to shovel off all of their strengths for a live service game, 
I feel like it's gimped most of its best parts in the process. The story can never have a resolution because there is no structure, the gameplay will never evolve past level 20, you will never elicit the same fun you got in those first few hours, and for a live service model it's a lot like if Leatherface was trying to lure you out by wearing the face of Danny DeVito. I'm intrigued and would have entered your home if you weren't carrying a fucking chainsaw. Here's something the online service offers though. I don't want to get too deep already because I've already been writing a lot as is, but the advanced horror system is something I don't completely understand yet, which not only makes it exciting, but I can summarize it pretty quickly because of that. Hurrah for shoddy work ethics. The system listens in to your voice and tries to mess with you. I don't understand what it's doing with your breathing, but unlike the Catholic Church, I can actually tell you where your prayers are going. Every time you make an offering, you get to ask one of several gods a question, and they might answer you, leading some random player to hear it. The problem is, I can't tell who's harder to understand, the bum with the $20 goodwill mic, or the gods with the backing of an entire studio. I'm a god and you will kneel in front of me. Kevin, I'm to kneel before someone called Kevin, my delicious little runnut. I could be bound and gagged. I could be asleep, your razor at my throat, and it wouldn't save you. But I still wouldn't bother eating you. There is one thing, though, that might keep this game alive for a bit, and that's the stalker. And there's a stalker, too. Uh, down, I'll down. film you, too, dick. Stalker watching us. The Stalker is a player-controlled character whose goal is to sabotage a random player's game. It's a PvP element that really changes how things get done. He gets a mobility power and you use it to record the crimes that your stalkies commit. After you get enough evidence, the shape will start pursuing them and it's fucking awesome. The other players don't know when or if you've been spawned, so stealth is your ally. Get caught and you'll have the whole club bearing down on you and you'll lose pretty quickly. I know this sounds like legitimate griefing, but I would have two points to make. One, the Stalker is so vastly outmatched that he isn't going to ruin your experience. Secondly, it's opt-in, so you're never forced to deal with it. But, with everything, there are some things I don't like, because I'm a miserable asshole. For one, the Stalker doesn't have any customizable powers or perks, which means you are again robbed of personalizing yourself further. But the big Taco Bell burrito bullet in the Stalker game mode is the fact that there's very little reason to do it. You don't get points for your other character, and the only reward you get is based on a leaderboard system that gamers have stopped caring about since the opinion of Jack Thompson. And I don't want this to come off as incredibly spiteful, but it's hard for me to boil down this opinion into a score out of 10. If you didn't listen to my warning at the start, and all you've seen here still makes you want to play, do it. I might even stream this once or twice if the opportunity shows itself, because there is a little bit of fun I'm still getting out of it. There's so much I haven't even touched on yet, but I'm already on my seventh page of this script, and yeah, I don't think my retention time's that good anyway. But for now, I got a torture session to go through. Mm -hmm.